Have you ever faced a circumstance in life where you just didn't know what to do? Well, of course you have. I guess the question would be, how long has it been or when was the last time? Or, you know, maybe you're in a circumstance like that right now. The days in which we live may make us feel like we just don't know how to function exactly. What are things going to look like tomorrow or next week or in a month or a year from now? And in all honesty, we really don't know. We never did, but circumstances have allowed us for quite some time perhaps to assume that things will be pretty much like they've always been. But what if they're drastically different? What if they're harder? What if there's difficulty and trial that stands in front of me in my life that I have not yet experienced? How do I handle that? And if I don't know what to do, how can I find out? Well, Paul was writing to these believers at the church in Philippi because they had heard about the trial, the difficulty in which Paul found himself. He was actually in prison for preaching Jesus Christ. He found himself there and he wrote to these believers to tell them, first of all, I want you to think the right way about this. God's plan has not been derailed or sidetracked at all. In fact, God is able to use my circumstances to further the work of the good news of Jesus. And I want you to understand that. And I want you to know, Paul, wanted, Paul communicated to them, I want you to know that God is able to use your circumstances in the same way. But here's what you need to do. As a church there in Philippi, here's what you need to do. And I would say as well, here's what we need to do as a church here in Silver Lake. We're going to need to stand firm for Jesus Christ. We're going to need to be steadfast to continue to do what Jesus wants us to do, continue to obey him, continue to hold firm to what he has taught. We need to continue to live for him no matter what comes our way. But in order for us to do that as a church, we're going to have to do that by standing together. We're going to have to be unified. We're going to have to find unity with one another. In fact, that's what Paul said. You, you know what it means as individuals and as a church to be ministered to by Jesus Christ himself. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1, we're going to be in Philippians 2 this morning. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1, he writes, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, if any compassion and mercy and sympathy, if you've found that in Christ, and he's not asking them, well, I'm not sure if you have or not. He's saying, you know what it is to live in Christ. You've experienced this from him. You've experienced the unifying work of the Holy Spirit. You've experienced the comfort that has been brought to you by the supernatural grace of God at work in your life and in your lives as believers and as a church. You know what this is. And since this is true, since you understand what it is to be ministered to by Christ, Paul says, fulfill my joy. Here's how you can make me truly joyful as someone who has founded your church and cares deeply about you with the heart of a pastor. Here's how you can do that. Fulfill my joy, verse 2, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. I want to see you standing together. Well, how does that happen? If we're supposed to be steadfast and unified, how is that going to happen? See, the Philippian church had something very similar to our church here in Silver Lake today. It was made up of people. Their church had people in it. Our church has people in it. And if we know anything about being in the same room with people for very long, it won't take long before we get on each other's nerves or we disappoint one another or we hurt one another intentionally or unintentionally, hopefully unintentionally, but we are sinners. You put sinners in a room together, sin's going to take place, and that's going to happen. And something else is true about people. No two people are exactly alike. 
we're not exactly alike in the way that we think and what we like and in our personalities and how we process information and how we respond in different circumstances. We have likes and dislikes that differ from one another. We have uh, strong desires that differ from one another. We have natural personalities that will cause us to lean naturally this way or that way in any, any given circumstance. And yet Paul says, here's how you can fulfill my joy on the basis of your experience of faith in Jesus Christ. You can be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. I like how one person put it, thinking differently, but in the same direction. Well, how does that happen? We need something else. We need humility. He said in chapter 2 and verse 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, verse 4, but every man also on the things of of others. Let this mind be in you. Be thinking this way. Let this be your disposition. Let's, let this be your direction. Let this be what characterizes how you function. And let me point out in verse 5, not how you function individually within your own heart and mind, although that's true, but how you function as a body. When Paul says, let this be in you, it's among you all of you. Let this be the way you conduct yourselves. Let this be what guides you. Let this be a driving force in who you are as a church, this attitude of humility. Well, you know, sometimes I need examples, especially with a concept like this. Is there a place that I can look to see how to live this out. Well, there absolutely is. And Paul directs it that way. In fact, Paul takes us exactly where you'd expect him to take us. He takes the church of Jesus Christ back to Jesus Christ. Would you take a few minutes with me this morning and consider Jesus? Let this mind be in you, verse 5, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross." Well, Paul keeps going there. I, I know, and we will next time, but I want us to take a few minutes and look at what Jesus thought and what he did and maybe remind us of something or instruct us in something you might not have considered. We consider Paul's command to us that we have this way of thinking in us that we as a body be characterized by this mindset. And I'll say again, the, the only way that this body of Community Baptist Church can be characterized by this kind of unity and humility, by this kind of humility in particular, is if the individual members of this body are characterized by this kind of humility. So by saying this is Paul speaking to the body as a whole doesn't absolve me of my individual responsibility to have this mind in me to be characterized by this direction as well. But the whole body here is told, looking back to where we've been, to look ahead here to Christ and Christ's example. Could we consider the attitude of Jesus Christ? The attitude of Jesus Christ, he rejected entitlement thinking. He rejected entitlement thinking who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. This word form speaks to the nature or the character of something which emphasizes both the internal and external form. The idea is that, as, as one pastor put it, the idea here is that before the incarnation, before Jesus became a human being, from all eternity past, Jesus 
pre-existed as God, equal with God the Father in every way by his very nature and innate being, Jesus Christ is, always has been, and forever will be fully divine. He was truly and is truly God. I've mentioned to you before, if you get Jesus wrong, you're going to get everything else wrong. And so if somebody comes to you and tells you Jesus was a great example, but he wasn't God. He was a great teacher, but he wasn't God. He was like God, but he wasn't God. Well, he's one of many gods. If you get Jesus wrong, everything else is going to be wrong. Jesus existed as God. And that's what this idea of form means. In our day and age, we talk about, well, it has, it, it has the form of it. We can say, well, that's, that's what it looked like, but it wasn't the real thing. Well, let me question just a couple statements later here. Being found, he, he took upon him the form of a servant. Anybody want to look at Jesus' life and say, well, he wasn't actually a servant. He just kind of looked like one. Uh, no. He was truly God. He became truly a servant as well. But I said Jesus rejected entitlement thinking. Notice here, being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He did not view his own glory, his own power, a thing to be grasped and held on to, a thing to be used for his own advantage. He was in an advantaged position, and he chose to set that advantaged position aside for somebody else, for me, for you. This church is supposed to know the same kind of humility in the way that we conduct ourselves and in the way that we are driven as a church, the same kind of humility that we see in the attitude of Jesus Christ himself. He did not consider his own glory, his own power, his own majesty as something to be used to his own advantage, rather he rejected entitlement thinking and he traded his own agenda for that of the Father. Made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself. Still truly, fully God. But he took upon himself the form of a servant. I like as one pastor put it, he made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself of his divine glory. He still possessed it, but you couldn't see it. That baby in that feed trough. He emptied himself of independent divine authority. As you read his life and look at his life in the Gospels, he spent the, that earthly life doing all those things that pleased the Father, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, is exactly how he tells us to live. He still possessed all of his divine attributes, but he did not use them except at the direction of the Father and the leading of the Spirit. He emptied himself of the voluntary exercise of some of those divine attributes. He set aside his own eternal riches. What did Paul say? Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might be rich. He emptied himself, as one pastor said, of his unique, intimate, face-to-face -face relationship with his heavenly Father, even to the point of being rejected by him. Consider Christ. Consider his attitude. He rejected entitlement thinking. He traded his own agenda for that of the Father. He became a human being. He was made in the likeness of men. He was found in fashion as a man. Well, Jesus came and took on a human body a human body with no sin, but a human body that was still subject to being tired, thirsty, hungry. A human experience that knew and understood and experienced the depths of rejection, betrayal, 
deprivation, sadness, a human existence that experienced firsthand what it is to be the brunt of completely irrational, unholy anger against him. A human existence that ultimately resulted in him being put to death. Truly God. But he set himself aside for me. All his divine riches and glory and majesty still belonged to him, but he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, took on a human body and lived as a human being. And he did that for you. And he did that for me. Consider Christ's attitude. Rejected entitlement thinking, traded his agenda for that of the Father, became a human being. And then consider his actions. He humbled himself. And if Paul knows that we're going to need to be steadfast, in order to be steadfast, we're going to have to be unified. And in order to be unified, we're going to have to be humble. The best place, the best way he can reinforce that truth for us is to point us to Jesus Christ. Who humbled himself. Have you ever listened to yourself? Have you ever caught yourself saying things out loud and then heard what they sounded like? I'm not rich enough. I don't have enough. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might be rich. I'm not successful enough. Isaiah 53 and verse 1. Who has believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? I'm not attractive enough. Isaiah 53, 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of a dry ground, he has no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. I'm not happy enough. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. I'm not appreciated enough. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. I'm not being treated fairly. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned. Every one of us have turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Well, I'll not stand for this. I'll give him a piece of my mind. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. My life is too short. It's not fulfilling. 
he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. I'm not sure God loves me. For God has made Christ to be sin for us, the one who knew no sin, so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. Consider Jesus. I told you as we look to Jesus as an example, there's something else here that you may not have thought of, but it is critical to what Paul is saying to these believers. And it's so important for you and for me to understand. Jesus obeyed the Father. He became obedient to the point where he actually died, and he actually died on a cross in obedience to the Father because it was through his death that he could bear my sin and satisfy the debt that I owed for my sin, which is death. He could die in my place. And he rose from the dead, which shows us that God accepted his perfect sacrifice. And now he's able to take his righteousness, the righteousness of God himself, and cover me with that to make me right with him. That's not just example. Jesus is not only the example of the humility that needs to characterize our church, he is himself the basis of that humility. Paul is telling us much more than just, you know how Jesus was humble? You need to be humble too. Certainly that's true. But so much more. He is saying, you believers in Philippi, you let this mind characterize you in Jesus Christ. It is your relationship with Jesus Christ that produces this mind in you. Not just start thinking this way, but if you are in Christ, he produces thinking this way. Jesus Christ is the basis of our, of our unity. It is Jesus himself who produces the humility that he calls for. So when you and I find ourselves seeking to exalt ourselves above and against and over someone else, when we lose patience with the people around us, when we decide, you know what, they didn't treat me the way I think they should, so I'm just going to write them off, that is not characteristic of somebody who belongs to Jesus Christ. That's not what a believer should look like. Because the Jesus who made you his makes you like him. And Jesus humbled himself. So that should cause us to think very powerfully as we conclude this morning. If your life is not characterized by this kind of humility, if that's not where you're living, what's wrong? Especially if you claim to be in Christ, if there's not some evidence of growth in this kind of humility, are you in Christ? Are you walking with Christ? If our church can be torn apart and divided by the circumstances that surround us and the circumstances that exist in this world, is our church truly led by Jesus Christ? And one final thought. This is not just a set of helpful instructions. This is so much more than an example to follow because the reality is for you and for me, apart 
from a personal connection to Jesus Christ, apart from me personally being placed into Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit through repentance and faith, unless that has happened, I will never be able to live this way the way God wants me to. Living this way requires Jesus himself living this through me. You cannot do this apart from Jesus. If you could do this apart from Jesus, he didn't need to die. But he had to die because we can't do this. There will be plenty of circumstances, and we're already in difficult circumstances as a church, and there will be more coming up that will threaten to pull us apart, threaten to get us to divide up against one another, threaten to cause us to scatter, but we want to stay steadfast in our devotion to Jesus Christ. The only way we can stay firm is if we stay together, and the only way we can stay together is if we humble ourselves. And thankfully, we not only saw Jesus live it, but the Jesus who lived it died and rose so that he can live it through us. Consider Christ. Would you contact me about your relationship with Jesus Christ? If, you're question, if you have questions or you're wondering what that means, could I ask you just shoot me an email at cbcsilverlake.org and I'd love to take some time to talk with you about how you can know what it means to be in Christ, what it means to repent and believe on Jesus Christ. Let me call you to that today. And for those of you that are in Christ, may we see his grace and mercy at work in us and among us. And may we see the humility of Jesus Christ characterizing not just me individually, but characterizing our body as we live for him. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.